Hi everyone and welcome to chapter 18, Biodiversity Classification and Conservation. Now, there are three parts to this chapter, Classification, Biodiversity and Conservation. Duh. So, um, classification, we'll start with that because um, these are things that you already know uh, to some extent. So about fungi, plants and animals, eukaryotes and bacteria with some additional details like archaea, the taxonomic hierarchy, and some more details about viruses and bacteria really. Anyways, yeah, that's part one. In part two, we're learning biodiversity, a lot of definitions, many calculations and methods used in paper five. And last but not least, our final two statistic tests for correlation. Now, the first two were chi-square and t-test, and this is the last two. Last but not least, we have part three, which is conservation, where we'll delve into topics like the roles of NGO in um conservation, the threats to biodiversity, how to protect endangered species, and last but not least, why control certain populations. But for now, let's delve into part one, classification. So before I go into anything, let's talk about the taxonomic hierarchy. Now, what is the big idea here? So imagine all the living organisms on Earth, right? From the tiniest bacteria, microorganism, to like algae, sea, and um, think of plants, think of animals of different shapes and sizes, think of insects. So all of these living organisms on earth, right, those seen and unseen, are actually divided in a very scientific way. It's categorized in a very scientific way. So how do you categorize this? We categorize it using the taxonomic hierarchy. Okay, so each rank or group is called taxon, and the first things first, we take all these organisms on Earth and we divide them into domains. Um, there are three domains, three different domains here, and within the same domain, all the organisms in there is divided again, categorized again into different kingdoms. Okay, there's a little cute illustration here in the first page, right? So eukarya is then uh, divided into four more different categories, which is called kingdom. The animal kingdom, the fungi kingdom, the plant kingdom, and the protists. Okay, then, right, this in the same kingdom, it can be further categorized into different phylums. Within the same phylum, the, the animals can then be categorized into different classes. And this goes on and on for order, family, genus, and species. Now, each rank, uh, each taxon name, you have to remember. So here's an acronym to help you remember. This is what I found on Google. I didn't come out with this. Dumb kids prefer cheese over fried green spinach. I mean, I prefer cheese over fried green spinach. But anyways, this is a way to remember. D here stands for domain, K stands for kingdom, P stands for phylum, C stands for class, and so on and so forth. Now, if you find this really boring, which I do, and this is the safe version, the, 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 I, I think this is categorized as you, uh, there's many more crazy disturbing versions out there and the more crazy it is, the easier it is to remember and if you can come out with your own, even better. So if you have a creative one that you would like to share with the class, put them in the comments down below. <laughs> Anyways, let's look at the red fox which is an example of how these categories are used. Example of how the taxonomic hierarchy is used. It's in the domain called eukarya which is eukaryotes, the animal kingdom. And within the animal kingdom, there is a phylum called chordata, which is full of, full of animals with chordates. What's chord what does that mean? Okay, it's full of animals with spinal cord. We are in this phylum as well. We have a spinal cord. Class is mammals, okay, mam mammalia, order, Carnivora, family Canidae, genus is Vulpus, and species is Vulpus. Okay, this one got extra Vulpus. This one Vulpus. And when we write its biological name, we usually just write the genus and we write the species. 
And you can observe here that a genus always has a capital V in front, whereas, I mean, a capital letter in front, and species would have a small letter. And this scientific name is in italics. This is chapter one stuff, guys. You should know this already. Now, maybe you're wondering, okay, that's for the red fox. Now, how about humans? I'm a human. I want to know what taxonomic hierarchy I'm like in. What, what, what's each of my taxons? So for humans, this is my cute human, completely lifelike. Um, its domain is eukaryote. We are in an animal kingdom. We have spinal cord. We are mammals. But when it comes to order, we are not carnivora, we are primates, so think of all the monkeys, orangutans, baboons, okay, they are all in this group here. Um, for family, we are in a family called Homonidae, okay, and for genus, it's Homo, species is sapiens. Okay, again, you can see here, genus has a big H, right, big letter in front, and species, this is small letter S. Yeah, so when we say human beings, biological name, we say that it is Homo sapiens. Homo means man, and sapien means wise. So our species name is literally wise man in Latin, but I don't feel very wise, so I find it quite funny. <laughs> Anyways, so that's our taxonomic hierarchy and that's how we use it to classify human beings. And um, similarly, we use this method to classify okay, or categorize every single living organism on the planet. So think the elephant, think insects, think um, plankton, think microorganisms. Every single organism is categorized in this manner, in these taxons. So yeah, so that's the taxonomic hierarchy. Now, fortunately for us, we don't need to learn every single category. That would be nuts. That's crazy. Even I don't know every category. We are just going to do domain and kingdom, specifically three domains. Scrolling back there. Bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Okay, and then we are going to see four kingdoms of eukarya. Protoctis, fungi, plantae, and animalia. Now, we don't talk about this, or this, or this. We just talk about it as a domain. We don't talk about how it's classified further than the domain. Okay? So, yeah. Let's start with the three domains, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. Now, this here is the tree of life. Again, when it comes to classification, it's all about categorizing. Okay, so you take all the living organisms on Earth, you put them into categories, and there are three big categories. Okay, and you can see it here on the tree of life. So this tree is supposed, supposed to represent all living organisms on Earth. This is the simple one. You can Google tree of life and you will see the very complicated one. But anyways, um, you can see here that it starts off with a common ancestor because um, according to the theory of evolution that we saw last chapter, we believe that all organisms have started from one, maybe millions of years ago. Okay, and it slowly evolved over time. Um, and if you don't understand that, let me know. But anyways, this common ancestor, um, I don't know how, but it branched out into three different groups of organisms, bacteria, Archaea, this is new to you, and Eukarya. Now, there are many, many different types in this tree of life here. You do not need to memorize any of this stuff. This is to show you that this is a representation of all the living things on Earth. Now, there's a few different, a few things I want to point out to you before we move on. First of all, we need to know how to differentiate Archaea, bacteria and eukarya. You have already learned bacteria, you have already learned eukarya, and archaea we have not learned about, but pretty much, it's pretty much um, very similar to bacteria, except that, uh, except a few differences, and also um, its specialty is actually extremophiles. 
So a lot of archaea examples that are famous are extremophiles, which means organisms, microorganisms that can survive in extreme conditions. So think very salty conditions or very acidic conditions or very high temperatures. These microorganisms can survive in those places. And uh, cell structure wise, it's slightly different from bacteria. It has common grounds with eukarya and we'll see that as we go along. Now one more thing I need you to note is that um, you know when you look at a picture you always want to find where you are. So where are we really? We are here. We are in this group of animals. But the animal kingdom is actually insanely big. So I don't know about you but when I see us taking up such a small part of this tree of life, you realize that the world is so much bigger than you are and it's quite humbling. I, I just always had that thought when I look at this tree of life. Anyways, let's cut to the chase and go into the details of each and every domain. So we are going to present this, I'm going to present this using tables because I feel like this is most effective. So we're going to explore the differences between these three groups in terms of features. So in terms of cell type, Bacteria and archaea are both prokaryotic, and that's why archaea and bacteria share a lot of common ground with a few differences. Eukarya is eukaryotic, obviously. In terms of size, bacteria and archaea, again, are very similar, 0.5 to 5 micrometers. Eukarya is bigger, it's 10 to 100 micrometers per cell. Okay, not per organism, per cell. Now, its DNA and nucleus for um, bacteria and archaea are pretty similar. So, bacteria is circular DNA, circular DNA. The DNA is not associated with histones and plasmids are present. The nucleus in um, bacteria is absent and the DNA just lies free in the cytoplasm at the nucleoid region. This is chapter 1 stuff, guys. Don't forget it. It will come out again in A2. Now in archaea is pretty much the same except um, some archaea some archaea have DNA associated with histones. Some archaea have DNA that is not associated with histones. So it depends. Okay. Yeah, so that's a difference with, and that's a small difference right there. However, with eukaryotes, as you know, it's completely different. It has linear DNA, it has histones. Uh, there's exception to this too, obviously. DNA in chloroplast and mitochondria is circular, and we call them circular DNA. We don't consider them to be plasmids. So plasmids in, are absent in eukarya. Nucleus is very much present. Let's talk about the next category, organelles. So in bacteria and archaea, there are no membrane-bound organelles. These two are the same again. And in eukaryotes, as you know, as a eukaryote yourself, you know you have many membrane-bound organelles. And to have the full list and functions, you've got to refer to chapter 1. I am not going to go through every single organelle again. And I'm sure you don't want to hear me nag as well. So, that are Right. So, no. No membrane or mild organelles in bacteria. However, ribosomes is not considered a membrane bound organelle, so let's talk about it a little bit. And as you know, ribosome has two different types, 70S and ATS. In bacteria and archaea, they both have 70S. In eukarya, they have ATS, with the exception being chloroplast and mitochondria, which have 70S ribosomes. Now, the cell wall differs as well in bacteria and archaea. Um, cell wall in bacteria is made of peptidoglycan, but in archaea it's present, but it's not containing peptidoglycans. Okay, it's a different polymer altogether. You do not need to know the details, so I'm just going to tell you it does not contain peptidoglycan. Eukarya, okay, animals don't have cell wall. Protists don't have cell wall usually. Okay, cell wall in plants though, there is, and it's made of cellulose, as you know, right? And there's also cell wall in the kingdom of fungi, and that's made out of chitin. So different materials here compared to bacteria and archaea. 
Moving on to the next feature. So let's start with the method of cell division now. So bacteria and archaea both divide by binary fission. Eukarya uh, usually divides by mitosis and reproduction can be asexual or sexual. So I think it's like a common misconception that all eukaryotes are humans, you know, and a lot of students would tell me that all oh, eukaryotes, they divide by mitosis and meiosis. But that's not quite true because don't forget animals, uh, eukaryotes include animals, plants and fungi and even protists which are unicellular. So some plants, some eukaryotes, some fungi would divide by mitosis, especially in your body. And to produce more organisms, that reproduction could be asexual, so more mitosis, or it could be sexual, so involving meiosis. Sexual reproduction covers meiosis. But of course, you can write that in your answers as well if you want. Okay, Just remember that not all eukaryotes are humans. There are many, many different types. Let's talk about cell organization. As I said just now, um, eukarya got unicellular and multicellular, right? Like protists, some plants are unicellular actually. Um, multicellular also got, right? We are multicellular, many animals are multicellular. However, in bacteria and archaea, those cells are usually definitely actually unicellular. However, um, bacteria cells can have many different shapes, spherical, rod, spiral, com comma shape, and um, it has different arrangements. So yes, they are unicellular and they function alone, they can function alone, but some species of bacteria tend to arrange itself in a certain way. And to find out how they look like, let's let's look at a few slides and go back to the table later, okay? So bacteria, again, they vary greatly in shape. Okay, if it's spherical, we call it a coccus or cocci. Rod shape, we call it a bacillus. Spiral, we call it spiralum. And comma shape is vibrio. Bacteria is basically classified using shapes appearances and arrangement. For example, here we have streptococcus pneumoniae, which causes pneumonia. And you can see how it's little round things like this. And coccus here is embedded in the name. Um, this fellow here is bacillus anthracis, and this causes a disease called anthrax in sheep and cattle. And this is actually quite a serious problem in New Zealand and Australia. Anywhere there's a lot of sheep, okay? This is something that the farmers will look out for. You can Google. Uh, we can see vibrio cholerae, oh sorry, leptospira here. is spiral, so it has spira in the name. And obviously, you know vibrio cholerae. Vibrio cholerae is comma shape, and this is how a comma shape looks like. It doesn't really look like a comma, la. it looks like a sperm. But never mind, this shape of a tail is called vibrio. Uh, that it also allows it to be very mortal. That's why vibrio cholerae is called vibrio cholerae. La. Okay, so this is the shape. How about like arrangement? So arrangements wise, bacteria can form pairs, tetrads, strings, filaments, clusters, and palisades. And uh, this, this is basically how they stick together. So if this is for coccus, co cocci bacteria, right? If it's just a singular one, that is just coccus. If it's two together, that is diplococci. So two spherical bacteria together. Staphylococci means clusters and streptococci uh, means chains and you can see here going back one one slide here streptococcus pneumonia strepto actually refers to the shape of the filament and therefore you can expect this kind of arrangement from the bacteria species very interesting now in bacilli there are also different um, arrangements here uh, if it's slightly round but not very like overly it's called cocobacillus so it's a it's co i guess it's like a fusion between cocci and bacilli bacilli is just one diplobacilli streptobacilli is in a straight chain and this is what we call palisades this is the palisade um arrangement right here and it literally looks like an arrangement of palisade cells side by side like this um this is langways Okay, and this is just side by side. 
So I just want to say again that they are all still considered unicellular. So each of this is considered an individual. Okay, this is one individual, this one individual, this one individual, this one individual, right? But they're just arranged together in different ways for different bacteria. Now you might be asking me, Miss, do I need to memorize this? Really, do I need to know specifically what it's called? And the answer is no. You just need to know what's in this table right here. Right, that bacteria can form these shapes and have these arrangements. That are so that's it for cell organization of bacteria. Let's talk about extra points you can write in the exam, especially when it comes to essay questions. So for bacteria, you can write that hey, um, they have flagella, pila, capsule, slime layer, so extra protection from any antibiotics. Etc. And this one you have to refer to chapter one in order to find out like specific functions. Okay, but usually there's only one mark for ADP. Archaea, of course, we cannot forget that it consists of many extremophiles. Okay, la. not all are extremophiles, some are extremophiles, and they are just very famous examples of archaea. And that the membrane composition is actually different from bacteria and eukarya. Just like the cell wall is different, the cell membrane is also different. And just like the cell wall, we do not need to know any more detail other than that, other than the fact it's just different. And in eukarya, you can refer to AS chapter 1 in order to list all the organelles, okay, and um, the functions and structure of those organelles if they ask you to do so. But obviously, this is AVP. Um, the main differences are already listed in the last few slides. There's not a lot of marks for AVP, okay? So yeah, that's it for bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Now, eukarya... Okay, one of the domains okay, can be then um, divided into four different kingdoms. So this is obviously Protoctista or Protista, same thing, okay. Fungi, Plantae, and Animalia. Now, depending on what book you read, um, you will see that this bacteria and archaea is grouped together in this kingdom called Monera and this is just a side point don't worry about it so much because we are just focusing on these four different kingdoms okay so let's talk about these four different kingdoms in the form of table so let's talk about a few examples first so you get an image in your head as you um as we talk about the different features so you actually know a lot of protists actually you don't realize it, but plasmodium, you have learned this malaria causative agent, is a protist and it's a very complicated life cycle, right? Because it's a eukaryote. A lot of algae or LGs, I don't know how you pronounce that, LGs are actually protists as well, okay? And a lot of unicellular ones in the ocean, so not necessarily like seaweed, right? Amoeba and paramecium are protists as well. And as you can see from the examples, most of them are unicellular with some very, very few exceptions. Mostly as unicellular and some are colonial. So some, they are unicellular but then they live together in like a group. Heter in terms of hetero or autotrophic, some protists are animal-like, so-called. They are considered protists, but they are animal-like because they cannot synthesize their own food. And some are autotrophic, which is so-called plant-like because they have chloroplasts and they can actually make their own food. So again, heterotrophic means that you can make your own food. Autotrophic means cannot make your own food, right? And protists, some can, some cannot. Let's talk about fungi. So when we talk about fungi, you often think about these mushrooms and like how yummy it is. I don't know. I love mushrooms. I don't know about you. Uh, but actually, it also consists of yeasts. So things, microorganisms you use to make beer. Uh, and penicillium, actually, which are microorganisms that is used to make penicillin, which is the antibiotic you learned in AS. Cell organization wise, mostly are multicellular, but some like yeast and penicillium are unicellular. Fungi are actually great decompos 
grid decomposes uh, and they do not photosynthesize so they are actually heterotrophic um, i think a common misconception is that fungi is plants because we think of it as a vegetable somehow uh, but it is not fungi is fungi mushrooms fungi okay and fungi don't have photosynthesis it doesn't have leaves it is heterotrophic and it survives by breaking down other things so it could be um absorbing nutrients from a tree or it could be uh, parasites or saprophytes right so fungi is not a plant it's its own kingdom and it's very diverse as well it's about plantae so plantae which is the kingdom of plants um, also a wide range of them don't think of flowering plants only or big trees think of mosses think of ferns they are all plants some uh, are your typical plant structure have your typical plant structure that you learned in as some do not but they're all plants okay. they're mostly multicellular with differentiated cells and with different organs so you can see that plantae here is a little bit more complicated when it comes to structure instead of fungi it is definitely autotrophic it can carry out photosynthesis because it has chloroplast and chlorophyll and obviously you do need to know how photosynthesis occurs this is chapter 13. last but not least we have animalia the animal kingdom so think of vertebrates so this is what we call chordata animals with spinal cord is also called vertebrates insects worms jellyfish even corals are considered animals crazy right so animals are multicellular with many types of differentiated cells as well but the difference is that it is heterotrophic it does not produce its own food cannot carry out photosynthesis so this is not really enough you know to to categorize these four kingdoms there are more different things we need to talk about okay so let's see what makes each of these kingdom different so in cell wall say for cell wall prototis and plants have cellular cell wall fungi have chitin cell wall and animal cells do not have cell wall okay vacuole is present in some protoctis but not in fungi um, a very large central permanent vacuole in cells of plants and only small temporary vacuoles are present in animal cells when it comes to special organelles or structures protoctis don't really have any special ones but um, you can expect fungi plants and animals which are the more complex versions of of uh, organisms to have very different types of structures compared to each other okay so my so um fungi here have actually mycelium okay what is mycelium now this is a fungi structure essentially this is a mushroom uh, mycelium is usually mycelium is all around it the the whole thing is made up of mycelium honestly and each the collective thing is called mycelium uh, it is made out of hyphae which is the individual strands so it's like quite a i want to say fibrous and like quite a lot of a net like quite a big network of stuff and this is called again hyphae now hyphae is made out of many cells okay let me zoom in a little bit can i do that Ooh, okay so hyphae is made up of many cells here you can see now some of them have cross walls and some of them do not have cross walls so this is a single cell here single cell and uh this cross walls is really talking about this thing called septum okay and you can see each and every cell is like separated by the septum but in some fungi this cross wall is not there so this entire thing is connected this hyphae does not have cross walls all the cells are connected to each other and can freely flow so uh, one more fun fact about fungi 
haha, <laughs> didn't mean to have the pun, unintentional pun there, is that, again, the whole thing is made up of mycelium. It is a network of hyphae. And actually, what you see, the mushroom here, what you see out the ground, like the beautiful mushrooms that you see, these are actually spore-producing structures, or what we call the fruiting body. Pretty Well, in simpler terms, mushrooms that you see and eat are actually reproductive structures of fungi this is only part of the only one part of the life cycle usually it's like mycelium mycelium uh, underground and spreading across areas but when it comes from time for it to breed then a mushroom would grow so that's interesting you're eating reproductive structures of fungi whenever you eat mushrooms how crazy is that so yeah, I think that's the only thing that's new to you. Again, mycelium makes up fungi. It's composed of a network of hyphae. Hyphae is the singular few strands here. It may or may not have cross walls or what we call septum. And as we have seen in this fruiting structure, it reproduces by spores. Plants. Plants. We have learned a lot about plants in our studies in A levels. They have chloroplasts, that's why they can photosynthesize and make their own food. They have vascular tissue, aka xylem or phloem. And they have this thing called meristems. Now, meristems are usually located at the root tips or the shoot tips. And it's basically where cell division occurs. In meristems, a lot of the plant cells are undifferentiated and then slowly differentiate or, or uh, divide to help the plant grow. And therefore, it's at all the little tips, the ends of the plants. So yeah, those are special structures for plants. How about animals? So animals are even more complex than plants in a sense that the cells differentiate that can form tissues as well as organs. Okay, so plantae can form tissues, but um, animals can form even more tissues and organs. And in addition to that, we have nervous coordination and many hormones and can respond to stimuli much quicker more quickly than all these three kingdoms. Whew. Right, last two features to differentiate these four kingdoms. For protists, some have flagella and cilia and are motile, so don't think of them are don't think microorganisms don't move, they move everywhere. Um, fungi, they are generally not motile and they never have cilia or flagella. However, they do store carbohydrates as glycogen, which is quite surprising. It's like animals, glycogen. Plants are not motile. Only mosses and ferns, very surprising, have motile gametes. The organism is not motile, but for mosses and ferns, the gametes can swim in water. It has like little flagella. It's very cute. You can Google it. And in plants, uh, this one you should know already, storage of carbohydrates is in the form of starch, which, as you know, in chapter 2, is made of amylose and amylopectin. In Animalia, obviously we are mortal, we have feet, we can walk, um, and also cells are mortal sometimes. They have cilia or flagella. Think of sperm, think of um plankton okay think of yeah different cells that move animal cells with cilia or flagella think of your intestinal cells or your respiratory cells all right so yeah they are motile and of course they store carbohydrates as glycogen same as fungi that are and yeah i think that's it for the four kingdoms uh, last but not least, let's talk about viruses. Now, viruses is not included in the tree of life. It is not included in the three domains we talked about or the four kingdoms we talked about just now. Viruses are a non-living organism. And this is copied straight from chapter one. Okay, It's a non-cellular structure. It's very, very small. It's 20 to 300 nanometers. It's much simpler. It has no, none of this stuff. It has no organelles except these few things. So it has a DNA. 
DNA or RNA. It has a protein coat called capsid, which protects it. They have may they may have one or two coats, and over th that protein coat there may be a lipid envelope which is usually derived from the host cell membrane. Some proteins may be a presence on top of the lipid envelope as well, uh, some from the host and some produced by the virus itself. For example, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase which um, stands for the H and the N in like different influencers. H1N1 and all the H something N something, those are actually subtypes of this protein. To do something to do with its reproduction is uh, that they are all parasitic, and the reason why they are considered non-living or non-cellular is that they only can reproduce by infecting living cells and using the cell's machinery in order to produce its own ribosomes, ER and Golgi. Now I'm not going to repeat this to you because I feel you already know this. Um, take some time to go to chapter 1 and recap what you need to know for this chapter as well. Now, there's one more thing extra about viruses that we need to talk about. Because this chapter is about classification, we need to talk about how viruses are classified. Although it's not included in the tree of life, we have different names for it, for different types of viruses. And contrary to popular belief, this is a virus, but this is a, just a general sort of structure. As you can see in this little diagram right here, there are many different shapes and types. So, when we come to classification, categorizing, essentially, we are categorizing it by a type of nucleic acid they contain. So, we have DNA viruses and RNA viruses. Okay, and we also have, within those groups, single-stranded or double-stranded. So, it could be double-stranded DNA or single-stranded DNA. It could be double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA. And there are actually more ways there is, uh, they can, it can be classified by appearance and more things. Like if you see in this diagram, there's something called RT and something called positive and negative. And you know, I'm not going to go into details of that, but um, this is the limit you need to know for your syllabus. Okay? You don't need to remember any of these names. Don't worry about it. I'm just telling you that it can be classified in this manner. That's all. And with that, we're pretty much done with this first part. We first talked about the taxonomic hierarchy. Okay, remember the acronym? Dumb kids prefer cheese over fried green spinach. We learned about three domains and four kingdoms, the different characteristics and how to differentiate them. And last but not least, we talked about viruses. And that's it. So I'll see you in the next video.